This holiday season, you might be looking for nutritious, convenient meals to keep you energized on jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian-approved, ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all your holiday to-dos. Too busy with holiday plans to cook, but want to make sure you're eating well? With Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too, while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. When you're too busy running around to plan lunch, Factor has you covered with lunch to go. Effortless, wholesome meals like grain bowls and salad toppers that are ready to eat when you're on the go, no microwave required. Head to factormeals.com slash MC911pod50 and use code MC911pod50 to get 50% off. That's code MC911pod50 at factormeals.com slash MC911pod50 to get 50% off. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Whether your resolution is to save money, eat better, or stress less, HelloFresh is here to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a price you'll like delivered right to your door. So you've resolved to actually sit down and eat dinner around the table, but what do you do about those nights when your schedule is packed? Turn to HelloFresh's lineup of quick and easy meals, including their 15-minute recipes designed to help minimize mealtime stress. Every single meal I've had from HelloFresh has had easy-to-follow instructions, fresh ingredients, and when it's done, I feel like I'm out at my favorite restaurant. Go to HelloFresh.com slash MC911free and use code MC911free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash MC911free with code MC911free. The town of Moscow, Idaho is a smaller place with only a little over 25,000 people for the population. Located along the state border with Washington, there's not much that happens around there. Most of you, before a couple of months ago, probably had never heard of it. The area is sometimes called Hog Heaven because of the camas bulbs, which are a favorite crop amongst farmers to give as pig feed. It's really your average small town if you have a picture of that in your head. Farmers market on Main Street every weekend in the spring through fall. A jazz fest. Renaissance fair. You get the idea. Probably the most notable thing until recently is the University of Idaho, which is located there in Moscow. Their football team whose mascot is called the Vandals, play at one of the smallest indoor stadiums in America, this one called the Kibbe Dome. In fact, going on the small town fill of Moscow, it's generally very peaceful. There hasn't been a single murder there since 2015. But this all changed early morning on November 13th last year when four University of Idaho students were savagely murdered in their off-campus rented house. Today we're going to talk about that. Welcome back to Music City 911. This episode, I'm going to be doing things a little bit differently. I'm sure pretty much everyone has heard of this case in one way or another. 
Usually on the show, I have to have some sort of police-related audio before I'll do an episode on it, being I'm an I-1 dispatcher, and that's the core basis for this show. Authorities there in Idaho have not released an I-1 call for this incident. To tell you the truth, I'm not really sure when or even if they will. I have a feeling at some point they might. We'll just have to wait and see. I do have a little bit of audio that is related, though. On this one, I'm going to be relying on and reading directly from the affidavit that was just released a few days ago. This is the most substantial piece of info that has been available to the public since all this happened a couple months ago. It's taken a while to gather all this evidence, and it looks like it's really paid off for law enforcement in general. So I'll read directly from that in quite a few key spots, just so you don't have to. I'll start off with a brief recount of the hours leading up to the incident, and then get into how they managed to put this puzzle all together. Later on November 12th, the victims were all doing what most college students would do on a Saturday night, out partying and having a good time. Starting out with Ethan Chapin and his girlfriend, Zaina Cronodal, they went to a frat party at the Sigma Chi house. They got there somewhere between 8 and 9 p.m. and got back home around 1.45 in the morning. Victims Madison Mogan and Kaylee Gonzalez were at a downtown bar called Corner Club at around 10 p.m. and left from there around 1.30. They then went to a food truck called Grub Truckers after they left the bar. I can safely say I've been in that position more than a few times, hitting a bar and then smelling some incredible aromas coming from a food truck or a restaurant nearby that pulls me in. That was audio that was streamed from them live there at the food truck. They were there for about 10 minutes before their food was ready, and they left getting a ride home from with someone else back to their house. It seemed like everyone was back at the house just a little before 2 a.m. Two other roommates were also inside the house when the other four got back. From here, I'm going to go back and forth reading directly from portions of the 19-page affidavit that was just released. Keep in mind that a few names have either been redacted or abbreviated for most of this that I'll be talking about and reading from. DM and BF both made statements during interviews that indicated the occupants of the King Road residence were home by 2 a.m. and asleep, or at least in their rooms, by approximately 4 a.m. This is with the exception of Kernodal, who received a DoorDash order at the residence at approximately 4 a.m. Law enforcement identified the DoorDash delivery driver who reported this information. DM stated that she originally went to sleep in her bedroom on the southeast side of the second floor. DM stated that she was awoken at approximately 4 a.m., but what she stated sounded like Gonzalez playing with her dog in one of the upstairs bedrooms, which were located on the third floor. A short time later, DM said she heard who she thought was Gonzalez saying something to the effect of, there's someone here. A review of records obtained from a forensic download of Kernodal's phone showed this could also have been Kernodal as her cell phone indicated she was likely awake and using the TikTok app at approximately 4.12 a.m. DM stated she looked out of her bedroom but did not see anything when she heard the comment about someone being in the house. DM stated she opened her door a second time when she heard what she thought was crying coming from Kernodal's room. DM then said she heard a male voice say something to the effect of, It's okay, I'm going to help you. At approximately 4.17 a.m., a security camera located at 1112 King Road, a residence immediately to the northwest of 1122 King Road, picked up a distorted audio of what sounded like voices or a whimper, followed by a loud thud. A dog can be heard barking numerous times starting at 4.17 a.m. The security camera is less than 50 feet from the west wall of Kernodal's bedroom. DM stated she opened her door for the third time after she heard the crying and saw a figure clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. DM described the figure as 5'10 or taller, male, not very muscular, 
but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The male walked past DM as she stood in a frozen shock phase. The male walked towards the back sliding glass door. DM locked herself in her room after seeing the male. DM did not state that she recognized the male. This leads the investigators to believe that the murderer left the scene. That's where we're at with the time up until a little bit after 4 a.m. Murders occurred most likely between 4 a.m. and 4.25 a.m. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this case, a knife was used to kill all four victims. Details of what sort of act was used, whether it was a cutting or stabbing, hasn't been exactly told. There were a couple of redacted pages from the affidavit that seems to have been related to the deaths themselves as a page directly after one of the redacted pages makes mention of the county medical examiner and their conclusion that the cause of death was sharp force injuries, which could either be cutting or stabbing. The affidavit continues. During the processing of the crime scene, investigators found a latent shoe print. This was located during the second processing of the crime scene by the ISP forensic team by first using a presumptive blood test and then amino black, a protein stain that detects the presence of cellular material. The detected shoe print showed a diamond-shaped pattern similar to the pattern of a Vans-type shoe sole just outside the door of DM's bedroom, located on the second floor. This is consistent with DM's statement regarding the suspect's path of travel. So in this, the witness statement seems to be valid regarding the likely suspect. She saw him as he was leaving and saw which way he was walking. Where I'll come into this with the 911 call, without any sort of knowledge the actual call itself passed, when it was placed and a rough talk about what was on it, it's hard to really say too much on it. Although, the time it was placed, that's been talked about with a lot of scrutiny. The murders happened around 4 a.m., as I said before. 911 wasn't called until 11.58, nearly eight hours later. According to police, according to police, additional people other than the two surviving roommates were present there before 911 was called. Moscow police also went further with a post on Facebook stating the surviving roommates summoned friends to the residence. The 911 call was placed, quote, requesting aid for an unconscious person who wasn't waking up. They also state multiple people talked with the 911 dispatcher before police arrived. At that point, all four victims were located on the second and third floors of the house. There's a lot, just like I said before, and I mean a lot of speculation as to why the roommate didn't call 911 sooner. There are a lot of possibilities. From everything I've seen and heard, the house that they lived in was sort of known as a party house. Several roommates with people coming and going frequently. I can tell you from a couple times back in college that I was at a friend's house off campus that people would frequently enter and leave that I didn't know. It never occurred to me to call 911 when I saw them walking by. The roommate could have not known what was going on either. Though she did go inside of her room and lock the door, so it does seem she was frightened at least. Because of all the speculation and a piece of me hates even trying to get into someone's head as to why they wouldn't call sooner, I didn't want to have just my opinion on this. I was chatting with someone very close to me about this and asked for her opinion. We talked about different reasons she might not have called immediately. The talk of her being intoxicated like the rest of everyone kind of popped up. That's certainly a possibility and could have explained the delay. She was drunk, went back in the room after seeing this guy, was a bit scared but didn't think too heavily about it, then simply went to sleep. From the reports, we don't know when the caller or many of the others actually found the bodies. So also possible she didn't really know the murders happened. But on the scared aspect, this is where I really wanted another opinion. I asked for a short statement to be written up about trauma which could be related to this. And to give you an idea, the person who wrote this statement is a former mental health professional, a graduate student at Harvard University with specific training in trauma and how it affects the brain. She also worked as a 911 dispatcher for years, but she didn't want her name mentioned, so I'll leave that out. 
Trauma initiates a fight, flight, or freeze response. The primitive part of the brain, often referred to as the reptilian brain, which includes the amygdala, limbic region, and brainstem, perceives stressors as threats to life, such as being confronted by an animal predator. This adaptation evolved in the ancestral hunter-gatherer environment, as humans who responded to stressors as an immediate threat to life more often survived and went on to reproduce. The amygdala's primary function is to process threatening stimuli, and it does not discern between non-life-threatening stressors, such as looming deadlines or job interviews, and life-threatening ones like being chased by a bear. When we encounter a threat, the amygdala sends neural signals to the hypothalamus, which activates the autonomic nervous system, or ANS. The ANS is comprised of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic nervous system drives our fight-or-flight responses, while the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for our freeze response. Our reaction to a given stressor depends upon which system is driving the response at the time we perceive the threat. During a fight-or-flight response, the brain and body prepare to overpower or escape from the threat. Digestion stops in order to conserve energy and pulse and blood pressure increase to increase energy. Blood thickens in order to help with clotting, preparing us for injury. Blood flow to major muscles increases, while blood flow to extremities decreases, often leading to cold hands and feet. We experience an adrenaline surge as our brain and body summon energy reserves in order to fight or flee. In a non-life-threatening scenario, the physiological responses to stress may result in trembling as we have no outlet for this sudden energy excess. Dry mouth, as saliva production, part of the digestive process, has come to a halt, and sweating as a result of a sudden increase in blood pressure. During freeze response, we're extremely alert, but unable to take action to fight off or escape from the perceived danger. Pulse and respiration decrease, and we may experience physical immobility. Motor skills inhibition and or confusion. Our brains may enter a dissociative state as a protective coping mechanism to reduce the psychological harm of the situation. Freeze responses are most common in individuals who have experienced a history of childhood abuse and or neglect from which there was no escape, and those who suffer from PTSD or complex PTSD. Dylan Mortensen very possibly entered a freeze response upon encountering an intruder in her home on November 13th. She may have experienced confusion, dissociation, and the inhibition of mobility and or motor skills. She may have found herself unable to make sense of what she had seen or take action. As a result of traumatic shock, she may not have understood what she had seen, as she may have been in a dissociative state for hours. Dissociation is involuntary. The mind checks out in order to protect itself. Traumatic shock can impair cognitive ability and decision-making, which could explain why she did not immediately call 911. As I said before, there are a lot of reasons why she may not have called 911 like she did. There's also been talks of what she called about, which was stated as an unconscious person who wouldn't wake up. There were talks other places that maybe one of the roommates saw one or more of the bodies and then passed out. They could have been calling for that and still not known what had happened inside the other bedrooms. It's all just speculation at this point, though. Until more is released about this, we won't know for certain what was seen or what was said in that 911 call itself. Next, I want to get into how they caught the suspect, who I've decided to not use his name. I don't want to give him the notoriety he may be seeking from this. So from here on out, I'll call him suspect on my own and in the places his name is mentioned in the affidavit, which I'll go back to now. As part of the investigation, an extensive search commonly referred to in law enforcement as a video canvas was conducted in the area of the King Road residence. This video canvas was to obtain any footage from the early morning hours of November 13, 2022 in the area of the King Road residence and surrounding neighborhoods in an effort to locate the suspect or suspect vehicles traveling to or leaving from the King Road residence. This video canvas 
resulted in the collection of numerous surveillance videos in the area from both residential and business addresses. I have reviewed numerous videos that were collected and have had conversations with other MPD officers, ISP detectives, and FBI agents that were similarly reviewing footage that was obtained. A review of camera footage indicated that a white sedan hereby after suspect vehicle one was observed traveling westbound in the 700 block of Indian Hills Drive in Moscow at approximately 3.26 a.m. and westbound on Steiner Avenue at Idaho State Highway 95 in Moscow at approximately 3.28 a.m. On this video, it appeared suspect vehicle one was not displaying a front license plate. A review of footage from multiple videos obtained from the King Road neighborhood showed multiple sightings of suspect one starting at 3.29 a.m. and ending at 4.20 a.m. These sightings show suspect vehicle one makes an initial three passes by the 1122 King Road residence and then leave via Walenta Drive. Based off my experience as a patrol officer, this is a residential neighborhood with very limited number of vehicles that travel in the area during the early morning hours. Upon review of the video, there are only a few cars that enter and exit this area during that time frame. Suspect Vehicle 1 can be seen entering from the area a fourth time at approximately 4.04 a.m. It can be seen driving eastbound on King Road, stopping and turning around in front of 500 Queen Road, number 52, then driving back westbound on King Road. When Suspect Vehicle 1 is in front of the King Road residence, it appeared to unsuccessfully attempt to park or turn around in the road. The vehicle then continues to the intersection of Queen Road and King Road, where it can be seen making a three-point turn and then driving eastbound again down Queen Road. Suspect Vehicle 1 is next seen departing the area of the King Road residence at approximately 4.20 a.m. at a high rate of speed. Suspect Vehicle 1 is next observed traveling southbound on Walenta Drive. Based on my knowledge of the area and review of camera footage in the neighborhood that does not show Suspect Vehicle 1 during that time frame, I believe that Suspect Vehicle 1 likely exited the neighborhood at Palouse River Drive and Conestoga Drive. Palouse River Drive is the southern edge of Moscow and proceeds into Whitman County, Washington. Eventually, the roads lead to Pullman, Washington. Pullman, Washington is approximately 10 miles from Moscow, Idaho. Both Pullman and Moscow are small college towns, and people commonly travel back and forth between them. Law enforcement officers provided video footage of suspect vehicle one to forensic examiners with the FBI that regularly utilize surveillance footage to identify the year, make, model of an unknown vehicle that is observed by one or more cameras during the commission of a criminal offense. The forensic examiner has approximately 35 years law enforcement experience with 12 years at the FBI. His specific training includes identifying unique characteristics of vehicles, and he uses a database that gives visual clues of vehicles across states to identify differences between vehicles. After reviewing the numerous observations of suspect vehicle one, the forensic examiner initially believed that the suspect vehicle one was a 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra. Upon further review, he indicated that it could be a 2011 to 2016 Hyundai Elantra. As a result, investigators have been reviewing information on persons in possession of a vehicle that is a 2011 to 2016 Hyundai Elantra. Police and FBI at this point had narrowed down to what the likely suspect vehicle is, that white Hyundai Elantra. One thing that will stand out about this, it came from a previous bit in that affidavit that I read, is the mention of no front-facing license plate. Both Washington and Idaho require that for vehicles registered there. The suspect could have been from somewhere other than those two states. Because of the perceived direction of travel of the vehicle, they enlisted Washington State University to check their cameras for this vehicle. It was seen on five different cameras pulling back into the area around 5.25 a.m. the day of the murders. A WSU police officer later queried white Elantras listed there at the university. The result was a white 2015 Hyundai Elantra with a Pennsylvania tag that was registered to the suspect. To note, to note, Pennsylvania does not require a front-facing license plate. The suspect was listed as living in a nearby apartment complex on Northeast Valley Road. They later ran his driver's license and took a look at the description 
and his DL picture. The license said he is six feet tall and weighs 185 pounds. He also looked to have bushy eyebrows. This was consistent with what the roommate at the scene said. Further past that, after reviewing any sort of previous run-ins with him, it was determined that he was pulled over on August 21st. During the traffic stop, the officer obtained the suspect's phone number, which from here on out, if it's mentioned, will be called the 8458 number, the last four digits of the phone number. During their investigation, investigators obtained search warrants to determine cell phones that had been used by the cell phone towers in the area of the King Road residence. The time of the search was between 3 and 5 a.m. on November 13th, which was around the time of the murders. The 8458 number did not show up. But because of previous experience, the investigators have known suspects to leave their phones in a different location or turn them off during the commission of a crime. Because of this, police expanded their search. Believing the suspect was in fact the person they were looking for, they obtained warrants for his phone directly for three days total, from November 12th through November 14th. During the hours around the time of the murders, at 2.42 a.m., his phone was reporting to a tower close by his apartment. Five minutes later, it stopped reporting, which is consistent with being either in an area without coverage or him turning the phone off. It wasn't turned back on until 4.48 a.m., just after the murders occurred, and the tower that was used was on Highway 95, which is just south of Moscow. It appeared from these records he drove south for a bit, turned west, then headed back north towards Pullen. At 5.30 a.m., the phone was back using the tower closest to his apartment. At around 9 a.m. on the 13th, the day of the murders, his phone leaves the area of his apartment, then travels back to the King Road residence and is shown there between 9.12 and 9.21 a.m. Later, it comes back and is hitting again with the same tower at 9.32. This bit of info was important for another reason I'll get back into in just a bit, so keep that in mind. Back to the 8458 phone, a further warrant was obtained to expand and show travels before the murders. What's pretty shocking is that he was in the area of the victim's house on at least 12 occasions prior to the murders. He was casing this house and or the people living in it. And all of the times that he was there, they were all late in the evening or in the early morning hours. He was watching them at night. With all their evidence, this seemed like it was the guy they were looking for. One of the things I just mentioned, the 9-12 time, it looked like he went back to the house. There's likely a reason for that. The murders were done with a knife, specifically a model called the Marine Knife from the brand K-Bar. How do we know this? The suspect left the sheath there at the house. A huge mistake for the suspect and a huge win for investigators. It's very likely he returned to the house to try and retrieve the sheath, but he never did. From what we know from there at the scene, there was no DNA evidence left. Aside from one bit, there were traces of DNA found on that sheath. Another win for investigators. Overall, the investigation took some time. All these records and warrants, evidence gathering, it just takes a lot of time. Late December... The suspect's father flew out from his home in Pennsylvania to drive back with the suspect cross-country during Christmas break from the university. There's been some rumors floating around that investigators put out a be on the lookout for the suspect and his vehicle while it was driving back. The reason was they wanted to pull the car over and get a look at the suspect's hands to see if there were any cuts on them. Authorities have since denied this was the case, but I do find it odd that he was pulled over two times in the course of five miles in Indiana by two different agencies, both claiming he was tailgating. There are body-worn camera videos for both of these. During the stops, general talk like would normally happen on a traffic stop happened. Nothing out of the ordinary. Both stops are very hard to hear any of the talk 
because of the traffic noise from the interstate they're on. If it were different, I'd play it here on the show. But one notable thing I did notice, though, on the second stop, it does look like the suspect is hiding his hands between his legs. No mention if he actually had any cuts or not. And you have to keep in mind that this was over a month after the actual murders happened. Once back at home, agents from Pennsylvania obtained some discarded trash from the home of the suspect's parents. After sending the evidence back to Idaho, a comparison was made to the DNA they found there at the scene. Reading back directly from the affidavit, on December 27, 2022, Pennsylvania agents recovered the trash from the suspect's family residence located in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. That evidence was sent to Idaho State Lab for testing. On December 28, 2022, the Idaho State Lab reported that a DNA profile obtained from the trash and the DNA profile from the sheath identified a male as not excluded as the biological father of the suspect profile. At least 99.9998% of the male population would be expected to be excluded from the possibility of being the suspect's biological father. So essentially what that means is they have the suspect's father's DNA and it shows that he is in fact the father matched with the DNA there in Idaho. This was definitely their guy. At that point, a warrant was issued for his arrest on the counts of burglary and homicide times four. He was arrested there in Pennsylvania and a few days later extradited back to Idaho. This was a huge case and one that we will likely be following for a long, long time. It's definitely something I can talk about for a good while. And actually... I did do just that. This is part one of a two-part episode. In the second part, I bring on Bob Mata, who was a defense attorney and host of the true crime show Defense Diaries. We get deep into a lot of different aspects of this crime. It's definitely a long episode and a must-listen. Expect that to be out in a couple days. And Patreon members, you already have it. And the version you have, it's even better. It's an extended cut that's about 25 minutes longer. If you want to listen ahead of everyone else and get that extra 25 minutes of discussion, head over to patreon.com slash musiccity911 for access to that and all other bonus material there. Be sure to follow the show on all social media and leave a five-star rating and review on whatever platform you listen on. Until next time, For Music City 901, I'm Brandon, and y'all have a good one.